It's August 14, 1994, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. When he was captured, the Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein was found cowering in a dirty drain pipe. The famed mafia boss Francesco Pesca, meanwhile, was arrested in an underground bunker beneath a rubbish tip. Meanwhile, the notorious terrorist Carlos the Jackal was captured today in history in 1994 in rather more salubrious surroundings, lounging in a handsome villa in Sudan while convalescing from surgery to address his low sperm count. An ignominious, though comfortable, end for a larger-than-life character who once menaced much of the globe. Well, salubrious compared to a drain pipe, maybe. But I mean, he was in Khartoum, Sudan, because that was the only country that would have him by this point. He'd been on the run, the most wanted man in the world, for so many years. The American CIA operative who sort of discovered him had to verify his identity with a chap in Jordan because nobody had seen a photo of him for 17 years. Yeah, I think the thing that really stands out to me reading this is someone who knew nothing about Carlos the Jackal. In fact, in my head, I think I was just conflating him with Pablo Escobar as like one person. Mm. I thought he was some kind of like mobster or drug lord or something. I'm exposing my total ignorance. But just the fact that he was an international terrorist who was allowed to hang out in so many places, it made me feel like before 9-11 a lot of countries considered terrorism to be a bit like smoking like it's a bad habit (laughs) it's not nice but we're not going to say you can't live here he lived in Syria he lived in France he lived in Lebanon yeah so Carlos the Jackal his real name was Illich Ramirez Sanchez and he was a Venezuelan militant who had orchestrated some of really the biggest terrorist attacks in both the 1970s and the 80s and what came of that was this incredibly long manhunt that had turned him into an almost most mythical figure. You know, reportedly he was a master of disguise who was incredibly cunning and also very slippery. He was good at escaping capture at the very last minute. But some of his notoriety stemmed from Carlos's image also as this really flamboyant gunman with a taste for the good life and then this catchy nickname, which was earned from British tabloids, actually, after the novel The Day of the Jackal was reportedly found in one of his hideouts. Yeah, that was kind of a funny side note as well. This is in 1975. A Guardian journalist was visiting the flat of Carlos's ex-girlfriend and spotted a copy of Day of the Jackal by Frederick Forsyth on the bookshelf. It actually belonged to her and her current boyfriend. It had nothing to do with (laughs) Carlos the Jackal, but the journalist saw it and thought, bingo. He already has one nickname, Carlos, as we mentioned, that wasn't his birth name. Now he's got another nickname. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, the Carlos name he picked up many decades earlier... Um, He joined Venezuela's Communist Party as a teenager. In 1968, he was sent to Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow, which was the Soviet Union's school, basically for training Russian agents from abroad, right? And when he was Mm -hmm. there, he met some Palestinian fighters, got in with them, and one of them nicknamed him that, Carlos, because he was from Latin America. I mean, really lazy. It's a bit like, you know, those English guys who were in ISIS that were called the Beatles because of their accents. It's literally like, oh, you're from Venezuela. Let's call you Carlos. It's right. like when you go to Spain and your dad starts calling the waiter Pedro. That was yeah. essentially what they did to him. But I mean, exactly. it's because he had a very non, you know, he had a very non-South American name, Illich Ramirez Sanchez. I mean, as you may have guessed from the name, his father was a Marxist. He was also a, quite a well-to-do lawyer, which apparently are two things you can be at the same time. His younger brothers were named Lenin and Vladimir. Um, Uh, Apparently, this was all very much against the wishes of their mother, who wanted them to have normal Christian South American names. By the age of 16, Illich was spending the summer at guerrilla warfare training camps run by the Cuban Secret Service. And unsurprisingly, at this point, mum decided to peace out. She divorced their father and she moved with he and his brothers to London. From there, as you mentioned, he went to Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow. But he was actually expelled from university for becoming involved with the Arab liberation movement. As you might suspect, Soviet Russia didn't really enjoy unauthorised street protests, so they kicked him out. (laughs) He went out and sought further revolutionary training with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And after the PFLP was ejected from Jordan in the early 70s, Carlos was sent to London where he collected a list of names as potential targets for kidnapping and assassination. And all of this culminated in Carlos's first mission, which was the murder of Joseph Seif, the president of the retailer Marks and Spencers, and one of Britain's most prominent Jewish businessmen. And so in 19 
1973, Carlos forced his way into Sif's home at gunpoint and seriously wounded uh, Sif with a shot to the head, but his gun jammed and before he could fire again, he was forced to flee the scene. And this kind of sets up the pattern of some of his uh, terrorism efforts, which weren't all successful. Yeah, I mean, it's crude stuff. Like, some of it is literally, like, taking the tag off a grenade and just lobbing it into a place and running off. Right. But then some of it, weirdly, is sort of glamorous, you know, because he was a rich kid, as we've said, and he had, I suppose, a sort of cool and swarthy reputation when he was in London nightclubs in the 1970s. Women used to like him. He was able to go out, date leave suspect packages in women's homes. I mean, the reason that that Guardian journalist was in that woman's house and saw the copy of Day of the Jackal was because he'd stored a load of ammunition there and a list of British Jews. It's what he used to do with women, was go, like meet them on dates and then leave crap in their house. <laughs> and sometimes dynamite and things like that. But he, he'd do things like bomb newspapers, um, the British HQ of an Israeli bank, um, working his way up to actually lobbing rockets at an El Al plane in France mm. on the runway. But all of these things sort of amateurish. Yeah, well, I think a lot of it comes from the fact that the Free Palestine movement at the time was less influenced by religious interests. And it was more of a cause celeb for socialist revolutionaries around the world, kind of in a similar way that the Spanish Civil War was in the 1930s. So there was a certain cool cachet to being involved with it you know it wouldn't as it might now lead people to think that possibly that you were a radical muslim it was very much seen as a secular socialist movement in fact one of carlos's mentors was wadi haddad who was infamous for pioneering the use of plane hijackings as leverage for the release of the organization's prisoners and he was from a palestinian christian family but you know by the time you get to the mid 70s you're looking really at his greatest hits uh, in 1975 he killed two french police officers and then in 1975 came the big one. Yeah, this was December the 21st, 1975. Carlos and five others stormed a meeting of OPEC, which is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. It's kind of the cartel that sets the oil price around the world. So Carlos's orders were to ransom all of the leaders, except the Saudi oil minister Ahmed Zaki Yamani and the Iranian oil minister Jamshed Amazegar, who were to be executed. He had also been instructed to order the Austrian broadcasters to read out a pro-Palestinian statement on air every two hours during the siege, which they did. The next day, the terrorists and 42 hostages were flown to Algiers and then onwards to Libya, freeing hostages progressively along the way, including the targets that he was supposed to be executing, those two oil ministers. They were ultimately released in Algiers. It seems like there was a possible intervention from the Algerian president to secure that. And although this was by far his most high-profile attack... It also ended up leading to his expulsion from the PFLP because as well as failing to assassinate his targets, he was also accused of pocketing some of the ransoms that went lost. But um, what's extraordinary is that when he then goes on the run, I mean, you were alluding to this earlier, you know, he has support basically everywhere that the Berlin Wall hadn't fallen down on yet, right? So Czechoslovakia, mm. Hungary, <laughs> East Germany. There were loads of safe houses and official support for a while. He lived in the mansion of a Mexican millionaire in Syria he lived eight years in Prague whilst he was escaping the French authorities. Yeah, at this point, he was basically a freelance terrorist and his targets got very vague. You know, he'd started out targeting pro-Israeli newspapers or Israeli-owned banks. And by the early 80s, he was carrying out attacks like a series of train bombings in France, which killed 10 people and wounded dozens more. And this was very hard to sympathise with compared with, say, taking members of OPEC hostage, which doesn't really necessarily have that much emotional connection to the average person. But these attacks were very random and ordinary people were being killed. At this point, he was expelled by Hungary, where he had been seeking shelter. He was cold-shouldered by the Middle East at this point. He settled in Damascus for a few years, and then he was kicked out of Syria too, because he had collaborated with the Iraqi government. And that's how he eventually wound up in Khartoum, the last chance saloon where CIA operative Billy Wall first recognised his bodyguard and then his wife, his second wife, who also cut a very distinctive dash, uh, and figured that Carlos would be nearby. And what he did is actually cause a distraction at a nearby cigarette cellar so that Carlos turned round to look at that kind of fight in the street that he'd orchestrated, at which point Wall took 32 photos of him but, of course, it wasn't America who wanted him, really. It was the French. 
And there wasn't an extradition treaty with Sudan, so the French agents then sedated and kidnapped him. And the reason why Carlos was kind of convalescing in this luxurious villa in the first place was because he'd undergone this varicoselectomy uh, procedure, which was <laughs> d- directly to address his low sperm count because he wanted to have a, a, a child with this second wife, Lana Gerard. And so he'd done this thing to basically make that happen. It seems sort of like the most human of reasons to have inadvertently led him to the spot where he was then, as you say, tranquilized and then taken back to Paris, where he eventually faced trial for multiple different charges. And even though he's been in prison for the best part of three decades now, he has not lost lost his power over the ladies. He actually ended up <laughs> marrying again, marrying behind bars, his lawyer. Wow. And he hasn't even got anything to stash at her house. It must be love. He's got a high sperm <laughs> count, though. <laughs> Tomorrow. His officers swore to defend women and orphans anywhere in the kingdom. What a nice guy. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.